Dear viewer, I hope this video finds you well. If you've been following my work on Instagram or seen what I posted around here, you might know what this video is about already. If not, then... Okay, everyone's on the same page now. At some point in every hobbyist's life, there's a moment where they realize, oh, someone like made this thing. A version of this small thing was on someone's desk at some point. And that feels... nice. Whether it was made on the computer or by hand, it's still a tiny piece of someone else in a way. I first got that feeling when I got my hands on some classic metal Warhammer minis. I guess the weight also had something to do with it. It felt like a ghost of the sculptor was here, in a way. From that point, I got really excited about independent sculptors and casters. There is actually a vibrant ecosystem of people out there making miniatures, either for their own games or for other people's, or just because sculpting is their thing. These are from uh, Gardens of Hecate, I got them a while back and I still need to paint them, and they're just one of the examples of the amazing things that you can find out there. But buying cool stuff just wasn't enough for me. As I started interacting with sculptors online, I started wanting to go a bit beyond my own hobby habits. Kit bashes and conversions are fun, I'm not giving up on that, but I wanted to make things that were truly my own. But also, um, I have no money, and uh, sculpting minis is much cheaper than buying them. I like Turn It 28. I made another video about that game, and statistically, uh, you've watched that one already. The army that I'm building, the Red Ribbon Society, uh, needs six gardeners. None of the conversions that I was thinking of were really scratching the itch, so that was the perfect excuse to make six whole minis from scratch. I had some experience with sculpting little things in my conversions, but making a whole guy was a different thing altogether. Turnip seemed like the perfect setting to start the journey. Since any of them were a little janky, uh, they wouldn't look too busted compared to the state of that world. Right, uh, to make a miniature I'm gonna use uh, this list of gear, and I'm also gonna keep a budget list so you can see how cheap it is to actually start sculpting. First up is steel wire. This one is 0.7 mil wide, and honestly that might be a little thick for our purpose, but that was the thing that they had at the hardware store. Cork is the best material to make handles, and you'll find another million uses for it. Putty, uh, the stuff you will actually sculpt your minis out of. Some really fancy people who can, you know, afford an oven uh, will use polymer clay as well, so use that if you have one. Pliers and cutters. Don't use your hobby clippers for this one because you will destroy them. I would get some thin ones as they will be used to bend stuff with a fair bit of precision. Lube, uh, to make sure your putty doesn't stick. Clay shapers to, you know, uh, shape clay. These uh, bowl shaper things. A hobby knife. And uh, your favorite shivs. I, I use tools that I made myself quite a bit. Uh, this one is a chopstick with a needle green stuff to it, and this one is a pencil with a paper clip filed into a point that I've attached to the top. All of this amounts to roughly 40 euros, assuming you have none of this stuff around the house already. But you watch this channel, so you probably have some of those supplies already, or you can borrow them from someone who does. Right, you have your gear, uh, now let's start. The wire makes the most important part of your sculpt, the armature. The armature sets the pose and the proportions of your mini, and it will anchor it to your handle. The one I'm making here is for a human figure, but you can really tweak it into any shape. Uh, this one's for a squig, and this one is for a skink, for example. I'm not going to give you exact dimensions and methods in this video, because at the end of the day I'm still a novice and I would only be repeating the Tom Mason tutorials that I'm following myself. So just go watch Tom Mason's channel if you want to learn how to make a proper armature. As a complete newcomer to the art of sculpting, you may ask, well how am I gonna bring the usual like 
smart-ish uh, value add, uh, that's what I'm calling it by the way, that this channel is all about. Well, here we go. So my name is Jacob, um, my making name and Instagram handle is Van Hoos Miniatures. Hi, my name is Lex, uh, I'm 20 and I sculpt miniatures. I think the first thing I did when I got back into it was I, I bought a box of plastic, um, oh, what are they called? Cultists, Chaos Cultists. Um, and then I and a few other bits of plasticky toys that I found, and, um, and I think because I was so inspired by Iron City, I think I was kind of I mean, hang on, members. I remember sticking like a dry grapes, some grape stalks onto one of these plastic things, and that was probably the first little merc combination of a found object and a and a little figure that I did, uh, just inspired by them really, and then other people as I you know as I went along, and so yeah, the early days. I can't really remember when I first kind of got into sculpting. I think I think I, I I haven't I'm not a big collector of like Warhammer figures or get a player, so I've never had like lots of Warhammer figures like in, in the modern day sense. So I, I got quite into metal miniatures and had a bit of a problem on eBay, which I, so I deleted the eBay app off my phone. I think by getting into that, I think probably because of Instagram. Um, and just re revisiting the world of those metal, you know, hand sculpt miniatures, I just kind of completely fell in love with that aesthetic and, you know, and the typical thing that a lot of hobbyists say, where, you know, just the just the, 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 the qualities of a metal miniature and yeah. the way in which they were sculpted and the, the, sort of the organicness of those. It started out with Warhammer, like a lot of other people. Um, I think it was the Primaris and Death Guard, like, box set for like eighth edition i think yeah I think and is, yeah. um yeah um my dad got the primaris and i got the death guard and like from them i just started converting and then eventually started sculpting on like gross pustules and blobs all over them and i just got better from making all these weird mutants like a few of my early ones, like, I got a Primaris Marine and I stuck some blobs on his shoulder and, like, did a tentacle instead of a hand. And it was pretty bad, but, like, you know, I was just starting out and um, he's since been chopped up, sadly. But. <laughs> when was kind of the first time you actually, like, made a, a whole miniature from scratch, if you can remember that? I can. Um, it was, like, this weird demonic priest Pope guy. Uh, I still have him. Um, I don't have him with me. He's back at home. Um, but I can't remember exactly when that was. That was, yeah, about three years ago. Yeah. Um, I think during like summer or something. I was like really on a kick of. Um, like plague doctors, I don't know. And I thought like I'd make a whole bunch of like plague doctors and knights and popes. But I only got around to making that one pope guy. I'm still proud of him though. Um, like I got some teeth in and like I did his individual fingers doing okay. that. I think it just kind of came from wanting a miniature. So I just make it, you know? Yeah, I think that's a very relatable feeling. Just like, I I, I don't want to buy like a, a seventy dollar kit. And let's just make it, you know. And it, it, it's just kind of fun to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so like cool to realize you you have at some point you have that power to just say like, yeah, I'll, I'll make it. It's fine. Like Milliport is four euros a, a a thing, and like I can make a bunch of miniatures out of that. And first by sculpting really probably was fairly kind of abrupt in going into trying to make something. I, I didn't have a big period of, of converting miniatures with, sculpt, with sculpting and that's for no no kind of reason other than I didn't have lots of figures to convert and I wasn't making an army or anything like that or a warband. So I think, I, I think I'm looking at it now, I think 
I just kind of went into trying to make a goblin, I think, yeah. or a little, a little goblin, and and um, I think it probably was in like twenty late, maybe twenty nineteen, to be honest. Okay, yeah. Actually. Yeah, it's. Um, I think I got some magic sculpts first, and 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 and, and played around with that, and then kind of the whole green kind of magic sculpt that felt quite accessible, and, and then I got some green stuff and mini parts, and uh, uh, um, and and got into using using that, and um, so yeah, it was just it began with I mean, I began with began with a goblin. I think they're quite. Forgiving. Yeah, they're, they're uh, a good Cambridge, gateway. Cambridge. Like I see a lot of people yeah. like do like a little horrible gremlin man that's like yeah. twenty millimeters high, and that's that's perfect because yeah. he's gonna have like a weird face and he's gonna have have big proportions. So it's very it's a very liberating thing Definitely. to sculpt. In this episode, I'm gonna show two gardeners. I've done another four to practice before this, and the stuff I'm doing is actually pretty repetitive. For these guys, uh, aside from the tea theme that I was rolling with, I wanted to do some classic field worker figures. These are a staple of the nationalist movement that gripped the 19th century, and while I'm not trying for a naturalist style, the poses, uh, the clothes, and the color were really good inspiration. From that starting point, I drifted to a handful of pastoral scenes that I had in mind. Uh, this crow lady is from a Magic the Gathering card. And this one, sitting on a fence, was inspired by the start of my favorite movie. Of the two we're making, I posed this one to look like Van Gogh's The Reaper. Because it's such a dynamic piece, despite being a very simple standing pose, that I felt it would translate okay to my still limited skills as a sculptor. The other one is going to be one of my teapot men, like his two brothers here. He's crouching near a campfire while the water boils. The first thing I do is usually bulk out my armature with straight green stuff. I do the legs first because I might want to repose the arms before they're locked in. These big long bits at the end of the arms are used for weapons and equipments. I will clip away any that I don't need and attach extra wire or paper clips where I want to extend the tool. The hands will cover up any unsightly transition between the different wires. Uh, for some reason, my next step for each of the minis that I've worked on so far uh, has been to make the shoes. I don't know why, but I like starting that way. I'm not a shoe expert, but I can make some shoe-shaped things with the help of the art I got my inspiration from. The same goes for all of the outfits I sculpt. Fashion blogs and old paintings are a real gold mine for good silhouettes and outfit IDs. I keep going up blocking in the rough shapes, not really worrying about the details at first. Like with kit bashing, this is all about doing it in layers. I'm either using a straight milliput or milliput mixed with green stuff, depending on how much I want to blend it with surroundings and how much I want to sand it later. This squatting guy needed a little extra, and I thought, you know, given the horrible conditions of the world of cysts, that he would probably need an umbrella to protect his fire from the elements. For the blade of the size, I really don't care about the janky shape of the putty I'm putting on. I'll come in later once the milliput is cured and whittle it into a proper sharp blade. Play, like, play is a big thing for me, and I think um, the idea of play and all of this and i think that's where kit, kit bashing is so popular and so enjoyable and when i do occasionally just do pure kit bashing it is wonderful because it is just pure play with with things and and you can do the same with found objects really and i mean i mean not just for making things i mean i've got i've got drawers full of found stones which i can use to texture yeah sculpts um for me personally, well, you know, at times, like on my Instagram account, it may seem like I'm, as I said before, you know, making lots of things all the time. But to be honest, most of, a lot of my hobby, and I've spoken to other people who would say the same, a lot of my kind of making world is actually, is purely mental thinking about, thinking about what you're making and then extending it to when you're going out into the world. And, and I mean, I've always been someone who enjoys looking at things, you know, when I'm walking around and finding things on the ground and things. But, but if you kind of give yourself permission to kind of play 
in this world of making miniatures and figures and and kind of say, well, when I go on this walk, I'm going to just keep my eye out for something which could like remind me of something. It adds a whole other dimension to this world and it takes it away from the desk. And, you know, you can be in a woods and maybe you're you're kind of you're looking at things in a different way because you're you're looking out for the perfect piece of wood which reminds you of a face and 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 I just love that kind of you know I think there's you know there's lots of reasons why that is good for you you know it's good it certainly makes you be more in the present and all of that all of that kind of stuff but um, it's just fun you know and I think you know and I think yeah it's something I just really recommend to anybody like to kind of so I think also to break out of, of the feeling that everything has to be done with games workshop yeah. plastic pieces you know and because um, it really doesn't you know nothing wrong with that and, uh, you know no judgment on people who that is what they love doing i was like traveling to sheffield and on the train while i was going there i like i was like just sketching things and i sketched a lego thing i made from a set i got like the other week like prior and I thought it was like you know it was a cool thing to delve into to like use Lego as a source of inspiration so yeah. I sketched up a one of the Explorians from like the old Lego themes long before my time um, I never sculpted it I might um, but after that, like I didn't really do too much until like more recently, um, where I fell in love with Rock Raiders through RR Slugger on YouTube. Amazing channel, highly recommend. Um, yeah, I just fell in love with the theme through that. Like there was going to be like a second theme for it, and like they had a concept model for a slimy slug just a big slug okay and i thought why not just make that so i sculpted it um i used like mega blocks because i didn't want to break up lego and like created a slimy slug based off that prototype one that could like fit with lego and like lego people could sit on it and it was very fun i do like loads of drawings and um most of them are just like one character in like the corner on a page and I'm like, okay, I'll fill up the rest of that page. I never do. <laughs> but I have a lot of pages like that. Um, yeah, I, I, I just like doodling characters. So is the process then that you just like leaf through a sketchbook and say, okay, I, I feel like this one speaks to me, I can sculpt him? Or do you start the process and like think of something to sketch and go from like the ground up on one ID? Um, sometimes it's like I, I, I'll have seen a sketch I did before and I think okay that was pretty cool and like work on that again maybe like I might sketch it again and like do another version and then sculpt it like I did with the Mellified Man. I did like three different sketches for that before I came up with a sketch I really liked and I just sculpted that and, um, my Oryx actually just came out of nowhere I was like sculpting on an armature with no idea and just came up with one of my favorite sculpts I've ever done so I have like this little toolkit that it's the same one I started out back when I was like making pox walkers and stuff, which I think is cool. Um, but I've since gotten a few additions to the kit that like I've made myself. Like one of them is a mechanical pencil with a sewing pin pushed into it um, as like a like very thin pointy tool to like sculpt tiny things. Um, another is a bit of wire put onto the end of a paintbrush that I kind of like filed down into the shape of like a flathead screwdriver kind of shape. Um, I use that all the time, all the time for like 
mouths, noses, um, little line details on like some of the things I do. Um, another similar one is like the rubber plastic outer casing of a wire. Okay. Like a really, really tiny wire um, that I like took off the wire and put onto the end of the paintbrush and I use it to do like rivets and eyes. Um, I don't know how I came up with the idea, but I'm glad I did because I use it all the time. This kind of hobby, if you like, you know, that has its roots in Warhammer and all this, you know, you can you can stretch the boundaries of it and, and maybe at some point it doesn't become about games and you know there's plenty of people I admire who it, it becomes just the narrative of the figure or the meaning behind it and you know I, I'm not someone you know I think I, I definitely identify with like folk arts yeah. and I think I feel like there's a lot of I, I feel you know I, I don't artist is not really a word and then a phrase that I have a comfortable relationship with myself but but folk art I, I really do does resonate with me and I think like a lot of sculpting is is I do really I think it was Nick actually uh, miniature who at one point said something about the idea of, of miniature converting and, and, and sculpting as a form of folk art and that really stuck with me actually and I think because it is and because like you know people are making their own mythologies people are making their own games or, you know their own kind of little little worlds and and, and, and maybe you know, reflecting the wider world. So that I mean that that smash back smash back bash bash figure with the eternal swimmer, which was again a bit a bit more slightly a uh, return to that theme. It was, it was a direct direct um, reference to the fact that for thousands of years people have thrown in items of religious significance into the temps. So you know you find you know Roman Roman kind of statuesque statues in the Thames, votive figures, um, pilgrim badges, um, people throwing in, you know, plastic, uh, kind of Hindu gods and nowadays, like, you know, it's, it's always happened. And so, and, and so, yeah, that was definitely a reference to, and, and the idea that, you know, you, you could find a sculpt that someone made now, you could find that in the Thames in, yeah. in, a, in a hundred, in 200 years time. So and I, that's, that's, that's kind of, it was, it was thinking about that really, but we're going back to kind of like... When sculpting with putties, I found there was a good bit of planning involved with timing everything right. You'll get the hang of it, but on my first couple models, I had a bunch of downtime while putty cured, and I wasted some by mixing too much at once. Now I just make sure to have multiple sculpting projects on the desk at once. That way I can use my spare putty on a base or another mini while the main one cures. Coming from kit bashing, which can be very uh, detail oriented, it took me a while to adapt. These models are small, like really small, and I want them to be painted at some point. So I don't want to over design and over detail my models. Whenever I caught myself thinking about adding extra details or texture, I just asked myself if I couldn't just paint that on. And usually that prevented me from going overboard. Still, it's kind of scary to have these big flat surfaces with nothing going on, but it's just more readable and more fun to paint in the end. As these two take shape and as I look back on the first four, it's pretty clear to me that I've gone a little beyond uh, the official uh, look and lore for 2028. I like playing in other people's setting, but I think I treat them more like a springboard than anything else. And Turnip to me feels like designed that way as a setting. I don't think anyone will mind if I have a crow lady and a guy who looks like he's wearing jeans in my army. I've been beating this drum for a while now, but I love seeing someone's personality and style in their work. How that's why I love Turnip, and I think the best way to honor these creative visions is to let your own art shine through them. My main place where I post things is my Instagram, at Chob Minis, Chob underscore Minis. I also have miniatures 
that I sculpted up for sale on Ramshackle Games. Um, I have two there at the moment, but there will be more to come. Really um, cool. Yeah, and they're not available yet uh, as of recording. I don't know when they'll be available, but up on Mammoth Miniatures, you'll be able to get a bunch of Oryx and Mutant that I've sculpted. Yeah, so my main scrub account is Banhus, B-A-N-H-U-S underscore miniatures. Um, uh, and the uh, Discord community, which I invite you to join, is uh, you can probably, the best way to find it is via the via Instagram. So indie underscore mini underscore makers underscore collective. And there's a Discord link there. So please come and join us. Um, if you want to check out a bunch of, like, a bunch of creators from around the, around the hobby, around the world, sharing their favorite films and books and things my old hobby my old project grimdark film club is grimdark film club on instagram um and if you would like to support my work by picking up some miniatures um head to www.mammothminiatures.com i believe yeah i think that's it i was on the website <laughs> earlier today actually but yeah yeah well at some point i have to call it done even if i think there are still some flaws you know, I'll fix them on the next mini. You know, I think they look pretty nice for a first batch of sculpts. I know there's a long road ahead full of improvements and new endeavors. I've had a real blast sculpting these, and I'm kind of sorry I waited this long to jump in, honestly. There's gonna be more sculpting going on on this channel in the future, hopefully, but there will still be videos about kid bashing, painting, and a bunch of other stuff I haven't started writing yet. Uh, obviously, I want to give a huge uh, thank you to Lex and Jacob. Uh, chatting with them was a great opportunity to pick their brains about more than just, you know, sculpting technique. Uh, you can find all of their links down in the description. Please go give them some love because uh, they really deserve it. I hope you enjoyed that interview thing. Uh, it was a bit of a departure from my other videos, but hey, it's only episode 4, I can do whatever I want with my format. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I'll see you in the next video where I uh, teach the ants that have uh, invaded my building to paint with me. Oh, hey, it's a, it's a letter from Tanner. Uh, I wonder if it has anything to do with uh, the, the shield slam results. That, that would be cool, you know. There's like, a, there's like an, an item in there. That's a, uh, yeah, okay, sure. Huh? Dear Noe, it is with a heavy heart that I write these lines to you. I was deeply hurt by your decision not to interview me for your latest video. But that was the choice you made. Someday, I find it in my heart I may find it in my heart to forgive you. Until then. Tanner.
Yeah, <laughs> I really do. <laughs>